I'm recording now. Uh, so good evening, everybody. Uh, thank you for joining me tonight for the good, the bad, and the bugly insects in the garden. So this uh, webinar, we will kind of be discussing some of the critters that you might encounter while you're gardening and what to do about them. Tonight we are joined with Heather Thompson. She is from the Pioneer Library System at the Moore Branch. She will be helping me monitor the chat and uh, kind of make sure everybody stays muted and uh, everything like that. So real quick, just a couple of housekeeping items. I have a chat in this, or um, excuse me, I have a survey in the chat. It is a pre-assessment. So if you haven't filled that out already, please do so that I can kind of look back and see what you know you were interested in and we can kind of tailor our programming to you uh, based on those responses. There will also be a post assessment that comes out uh, probably sometime tomorrow. Um, another thing too, we will be keeping everybody muted just to make sure um, sometimes there's background noise that we don't expect and uh, it's nothing personal, but uh, we will keep you muted throughout the presentation. Um, last thing too is if you have any questions, if you could type those into the chat, that way we can kind of go back and monitor those frequently throughout the presentation. So let me go ahead and share my screen with you all. And we will get started. Can you see it? Thumbs up. Okay, I'm getting some nods. All right, so like I said, thank you for joining me tonight. We will be talking about some of the critters and the insects that we uh, experience in the garden. So a lot of times when we think insects or bugs are, we maybe don't think about very positively. Maybe we think about insects that eat all of our crops and our veggies and are just kind of a pain to deal with. Maybe we think about the insects that are harmful to us, insects that can hurt us, maybe like wasps or bee stings or spider bites, all these things that are um, kind of unpleasant things that come along with the insect world. Uh, or maybe we think about things that get into our house, like roaches or, or silverfish or anything like that. I don't, I don't particularly like roaches very much. Um, or we think about maybe things like mosquitoes, which not only bite us, but can transmit diseases and are a vector for a lot of diseases that we encounter throughout, uh, throughout the world. Uh, also in pop culture, insects are not usually regarded very highly. Um, we've, you know, these are some older movie posters, but there are still movies from uh, the past 20 years or so that also feature giant insects that eat us and take over the world. Um, funny thing, we actually watched them when I took entomology in college so we could find all the entomology inaccuracies in it. So don't worry, I don't think giant insects are coming anytime soon, but um, you know, this doesn't really help the reputation of insects when we have all of these uh, maybe, maybe movies out there or or bad things in our pop cultures associated with insects. Or maybe you've been paying attention to the news and you've heard about the dreaded murder hornet and how it has, uh, we first found it in the United States and how it has the most painful sting associated with any insect or how it can actually go into beehives and decapitate the bees and can take out an entire beehive. Um, so again, not a very positive association for insects. Um, I do want to say as a, if you're in Oklahoma, uh, don't, don't worry about the murder hornet too much yet. I, I think we're still, I think we're in the clear, on the clear on that one, but I know it has been circulating quite a bit. But not all bugs are bad. Um, you know, we're taught at a very early age that butterflies and bees are pollinators and that they are very important in our ecosystem and for a lot of the crops and the food that we eat. And, you know, things like ladybugs feed on other insects and we want to encourage these insects within our garden. Uh, so tonight my goal really is to kind of teach you about some of these good bugs, uh, how we can keep them in our landscape and then also kind of go through some of the bad bugs and how to keep them out of our landscape or how we can kind of sort of foster an environment where the good bugs take care of the bad bugs for us. 
So the thing about insects is that they are one of the most diverse creatures that we have on in living organisms on the on the earth. Uh, there are more species of insects than there are of any other living organism. So mammals, fungi, plants, there is more diversity in insects. And largely, really only 3% of these insects cause a problem to us as humans, um, as we fight them for resources, for our food, or maybe they cause nuisance problems. It's really only 3% of this very diverse group of living organisms. But that 3% does tend to show up and cause some problems in our landscape. So some keys to insect management in the landscape. Uh, these are kind of some tools that you can use or some thought processes that you can use as you approach insects in your landscape. So first, know your landscape. Uh, know what you have in your landscape, what attracts potential insects. Also know your adversary. So if you know your, the insects that are likely to show up in your garden, then you are more likely to be able to recognize the signs and the symptoms of those insects and kind of know when to make, take control measures. Uh, and then also be aware of what tools you do have for control. Uh, those are all good, uh, good keys to insect management. So kind of to dive into that a little bit deeper, knowing your landscape, um, there are some plants within our landscapes that are commonly associated uh, with certain insects. So, you know, just kind of almost doesn't matter what it is, you plant it, they will find it. Uh, so that top picture there is a euonymus with some euonymus scale. Uh, euonymus scale can be a very tricky problem on euonymus, but um, they go hand in hand with each other. Almost if you plant it, they will show up. Uh, another thing too to consider is some of these close associations between plants and insects can create a nuisance for us, the home or the landscape. Um, so that bottom picture there are, uh, are a group of, is a group of box elder bugs box elder bugs like box elders. Um, they lay their eggs in the box elder, but they do not cause any sort of harm to the tree and they don't cause any sort of harm to us. That's just the host that they choose. And they tend to congregate around those trees. And we can think, you know, we see those insects in large numbers and we think, wow, that is a lot of insects. Something is gonna go something's wrong, something is, is going to cause issues, or if they start to get into your house, that can be a problem. So don't, you know, consider that. Don't plant box elders too close to your house. Um, and just be aware that that can happen. And then also knowing your landscape too, but the location of materials in your landscape can, can affect certain pest problems. So think for, for instance, you know, if you have a pile of firewood next to your home um, that can attract certain insects, particularly uh, anything that's looking to decompose that wood, maybe termites, carpenter ants, all things that want to go after that wood pile. Um, but since it's close to your house, they end up in your house rather than uh, what they're actually trying to do. Or uh, I'll, for an example too, I have a compost pile and I can tell you right now it's too close to my house and there are some insects in that compost pile that are showing up in my house and I need to, I really need to move that compost pile because um, I've got a living example of that right outside my back door. Um, but also know your adversary. So proper identification of an insect is, is really key to effective control. Uh, so at the bottom of this slide here, I've got three different kinds of stink bugs. They all, they're all stink bugs. They all kind of look fairly similar. But that one on the left is the spine soldier bug. The spine soldier bug is actually a predatory stink bug and will attack um, the bad bugs in our landscape. The one in the middle is a green stink bug and the green stink bugs, we don't want those in our landscape. They are the ones who will go after our veggies and, and feed on those and really diminish a lot of the productivity of our garden. So, you know, kind of both stink bugs, but very different roles within the landscape. And then that one on the far right is actually a brown marmorated stink bug. So it looks very similar to that first one, right? But it is, again, another 
insect that is going to go after our food, um, our crops or our landscape, and is also a really um, determined home invader. So uh, we have only had two sightings, I believe, of the brown marmorated stink bug in Oklahoma. Um, and that was just within the past year, I believe. But in states that have had the brown marmorated stink bug for a long time, um, they'll invade your home and fill up your home um, in a very unpleasant way. Uh, so just kind of sort of need to be aware of, okay, that's the brown marmorated stink bug, or this is a spine soldier. Um, but really sort of the, the key I'm trying to, to hone in on is, is knowing what you're looking at when you see it. Um, and if you do think you have a brown marmorated stink bug, you can email me because we, we haven't found one in Cleveland County yet. And if we do, we need to know it's here. Uh, but another thing to know is associate injury symptoms with pests. So if you see a certain type of injury on your plant um, and you think, wow, something is eating my plant, I wonder what it is, be able to sort of know which um, symptoms are associated with pests. And we'll dive into that a little bit more later, but just kind of sort of knowing that and really knowing how to diagnose the problems um, can really help you with knowing when, how, and if control is necessary. Um, so, you know, maybe if it's just one little area of feeding and you can't find an insect, you know, maybe it's not necessary to treat at that time. Um, or if you're finding all sorts of kinds of insects uh, that are eating on your plant, uh, then it may be time, time to control those. Uh, but really knowing, knowing your pest, knowing your adversary, that's how you're going to win um, a battle against a bad bug. So some major groups of insects, I kind of want to go over this um, to sort of reference later. Um, but so insects are, like I said, a very diverse group of living organisms. And when you hear about talking about insects, we oftentimes refer to their order. Um, so their order is um, kind of how we break them down a little bit more specifically. Uh, so starting with Coleoptera. Coleoptera is the order of the beetles. Um, beetles have two sets of wings, the top, the, the, the four wings being a very hard wing cover, whereas the second ones um, are the membranous ones that they use to fly. Um, so it can be very, um, very colorful often, um, but they have those, that's kind of one of their characteristics are those hard outer shells is what creates, um, or is how we classify a beetle. They also have chewing mouth parts, um, so kind of chomping they, they, they tend to chomp and chew the same way we would on, uh, on their food. So if you see chomping or chewing or, or anything where it looks like something has been eating it, it's a good indicator that that insect had chewing mouth parts. They also complete, um, they have complete metamorphosis. So when I say complete metamorphosis, um, what I think we tend to think of is um, kind of like the butterfly, but there is an egg, a larva, uh, pupa, and then the adult. So the larva is a very active stage um, and the pupa is not quite as active, but then the adults then become a very active stage as well. Uh, so that four stage metamorphosis is complete metamorphosis. Diptera. Uh, Diptera are the flies, uh, the gnats and the mosquitoes. So not oftentimes our favorite order of insects. There are, there are some good guys in this group. Uh, they too have complete metamorphosis. Um, their mouth parts vary depending upon the species. Um, uh, some have probably what we think of with the house fly or, or maybe the sponging mouth parts. Um, and so that is where uh, they have kind of sort of a sponge as a mouth and they will um, excrete a enzyme when they want to feed that slowly breaks down what they plan to feed on and then they will eat that back up. So not the uh, most appetizing way to eat, but that's how they do it. Uh, but kind of the unique thing about the diptera group and kind of how we can tell them apart from different insects is the uh, haltiers that they have. So they have one set of wings uh, the membranous wings that they use to fly, and then those little knobs, you can kind of see it in that bottom picture there. 
um, but those are called haltiers and they are used as a balance when flying. So if you're kind of ever looking at an insect and you're like, I'm not sure if this is a fly or a wasp or what this is, if you can see those little knobs, then it's in the fly family or order, excuse me. Hemeptera, this is a very large group of insects. Um, and so we refer to these as the true bugs. Uh, and kind of one of the ways that we can tell the true bugs apart from other insects is they have almost this triangular shaped um, portion on their backside. Um, so you can kind of see that up there in the top and in both those pictures. But that triangle shape is really how you can determine if something is a hemeptrian or a true bug. Um, they have gradual metamorphosis. Uh, so as opposed to the complete metamorphosis, when they hatch from an egg, they look like the adult. They're just smaller. And so when they come out of their egg, they will have several, um, they're called instars, but several stages uh, where they get bigger to become an adult. And, um, but the, the younger insects look almost identical to the adult. Um, in this family, they have uh, piercing sucking mouth parts. So with piercing sucking, it's kind of like a needle that they can insert into plant material or other insects. Um, and then they're able to suck that uh, material into, um, to, to be able to feed on it that way. Um, so, you know, if you think of a mosquito, even though that's diptera, that is also a piercing sucking mouth part. Uh, and they have two pairs of wings, um, the top pair being a half wing, um, so kind of hard like a beetle for one portion and then uh, membranous on the, uh, on the second half. And then the second, le second, excuse me, second wings are used for, uh, for flying as well, they're the membranous. So also sort of sometimes included with hemeptera are aphids, scales, white flies, leafhoppers, and cicadas. Um, so they're very kind of closely related. Also gradual metamorphosis and piercing sucking mouth parts. Um, sometimes they differ in that they might have two sets of clear wings, uh, but some are wingless like the aphids uh, in that top picture there. And then some, uh, specifically the aphids, can actually reproduce without males. Um, so they don't have to have those uh, two sets of two sets of genes in order to recreate um, to, to have babies and to really take over your plant very quickly. Um, so that's kind of how aphids can really uh, really take over the world is is not having um, being able to to have young without a male. Hymenoptera is another order of insects, and this one includes our ants, bees, and wasps. Um, unique kind of one about this one you can sort of tell is they're always going to have sort of a very pinched waist. So, uh, you know, kind of you can really tell there in that picture of an ant um, that between their abdomen and their middle section, which is called a thorax, it's usually very, very pinched. Um, so that's Hymenoptera. They also, excuse me, they also go through complete metamorphosis and have chewing mouth parts. Um, and then if they do have wings, they are membranous wings. Um, but in some species, depending on what species you're looking at, they might not have wings like ants. Um, sometimes it depends on if they're mating, uh, but generally they're going to have membranous wings. Lepidoptera, uh, which means scale winged, includes our butterflies, moths, and skippers. So I know a lot of people, um, this is probably your favorite order of insects, um, but they too have complete metamorphosis. Um, so that characteristic egg, larva, pupa, and adult stage. Uh, the adults have siphoning mouth parts, which are kind of like a long straw that they use to insert into flowers and suck back that nectar. Uh, which is what they feed on, uh, but their larvae have chewing mouth parts, and that can cause a lot of problems um, with some lepidopterans because if they've got chewing mouth parts, then they tend to chew on our plants, um, and we don't particularly like that too much if we're trying to grow vegetables or anything, uh, anything like that. Um, but in that bottom picture, you can really sort of see it very well. Is that um, their wings are actually made up of a tiny of a bunch of tiny little scales, uh, and that's how we get these unique, beautiful colors on their wings. 
Orthoptera is the grasshoppers, crickets, cockroaches, walking sticks, and mantids. Um, so they have more kind of like a straight winged, that's kind of what Orthoptera refers to. They have gradual metamorphosis like the hemipterans. And so there, when they hatch out of the egg, they look like an adult and they just get bigger until they reach that stage. They also have chewing mouth parts. Uh, grasshoppers can take out quite a bit of um, plant material from feeding. Uh, and then their front wings are leathery, but their hind wings are membranous, and that's kind of how what they're used to fly. Neuroptera, or the nerve winged, um, includes lace wings, antlions, snake flies, mantis spids, and dobson flies. Um, and this is a unique order of insects because almost all of the insects within this group are predatory. Uh, so they eat uh, other insects, and that's this is really kind of what we want in our in our garden. Um, so those that bottom picture is a mantis fid, mantis fid, or a mantis fly, uh, and it looks very similar to a praying mantis. It has those grabbing arms that it uses to latch on and grab various insects. Um, I don't have a picture on there, but dobson flies have very large mouth parts that, that they're able to use and grab on to various insects. Um, ant lions are kind of something out of a, of a sci-fi movie, I think. Um, they actually burrow into the ground and wait for insects to follow in, into their trap. Um, so that's kind of another interesting one too. Um, but the adults have chewing mouth parts and the larvae have piercing mouth parts. Um, so they kind of sort of feed at different times. Bisonoptera or thrips. Um, these are very, very small insects. A lot of times we maybe don't think of them too much, but they can cause some problems. Um, they have um, sort of a modified piercing sucking mouth part. It's um, kind of like a, I believe they call it a rasping mouth part, but what it does is it will actually sort of scrape off the top of a plant. Um, and so they sort of have a unique damage that they create to plants, and I'll highlight that here, here later. But those are um, sort of the various orders of insects that you will find um, if you're kind of looking at identifying them scientifically. Uh, but tonight we are going to identify them as the good, the bad, and the ugly. Um, so we'll start with the, the good insects, the insects that we want to have in our, in our landscapes, the ones that we don't want to control. Um, then we'll go over some things to really look for to identify um, when we have insect presence in the garden. Uh, and then for the ugly, we're just gonna go over some insects that are either gross or weird looking, or I just flat out don't like. <laughs> so that's um, how we will proceed for this evening. So starting with the good. So like I said, these are the insects that we want in the garden. Um, these are the ones that uh, will feed or somehow uh, limit the populations of the bad insects within our garden. Um, so a lot of times you might hear uh, referred to when talking about beneficial insects as the three Ps, and so that would be pollinators, predators, and parasitoids. Uh, and so all of these are a valuable part of the ecosystem. Um, and when we go out to control insects within our garden, we should really try and preserve these uh, and practice our, our garden management strategies in a way that allow these insects to stay in the garden and do what they're intended to do. Um, so I have there a valuable part of an integrated pest management system. And integrated pest management, I have the definition here. I'll read it real quick. It's a sustainable approach to managing pests by combining biological, cultural, physical, and chemical tools in a way that minimizes economic, health, and environmental risks. So it's really sort of looking at the system as a whole system and rather than just saying, oh, I see an insect, oh, I need to spray. So it's this idea of not just using chemicals. Um, so within this definition, beneficial insects really fill that biological role. Uh, so if we can sort of use the, the beneficial insects to our advantage, and provide an environmental an environment for them to do their jobs, um, then that's gonna be less control and less work on our parts. 
So starting with pollinators, these are insects that we really want to preserve within our, within our landscape. Um, so much of the food that we eat is dependent upon pollinators and so much of the ecosystem that we have is because of pollinators. And a lot of times, you know, we're quick to think of bees and butterflies, um, but there are more insects than that that do pollinate our flowers. Um, so we tend to not like wasps too much because they, they sting us and can be kind of aggressive, but they're still valuable pollinators. Uh, so if you see them in your garden or in your landscape, you know, just let them do their wasp thing. Um, don't agitate them and let them do their, their job. Flies, which a lot of times, you know, we think of the house fly and we don't think very positively of, but there are also several species in Oklahoma of pollinators, uh, of flies that are actually pollinators. Um, you know, we think very quickly of butterflies and monarchs and, you know, trying to preserve, um, pervert, preserve that group of insects, but moths are also a very valuable pollinator. They pollinate all of our crops that open at night um, and all of our flowers that open at night because they are nocturnal. So, you know, just part of the system that, um, that we have. Uh, and then also beetles. Beetles are one of the oldest pollinators. Um, they tend to like really big flowers because it's easier for them to walk around and walk in. Um, but they will spread that pollen um, from plant to plant and pollinate those flowers for us. So there are over 100,000 species of invertebrates that are pollinators. Um, so, you know, when we go to do, when we, when we go to manage our gardens or our landscape, it's really important to consider this. Um, you know, the world that they knew before Cleveland County was here, it's very different. Um, you know, they didn't have all these houses and everything. And so pollinators are just looking for some food. And so if you can designate a spot of your yard just for pollinators, it will go a long way. Um, because like I said, over 90% of all known flowering plants and almost all of the fruits and vegetables that we eat require pollination. So if we lose these pollinators and we don't provide an environment or a landscape for them that's conducive for them um, and we lose them, we're gonna be uh, quite in a world of hurt. So uh, just consider pollinators as we, as we move forward. So talking about predators, um, as the name implies, predators are insects that feed on other insects. So in general, they're much larger than their prey. Uh, so in that picture there, I've got a lady beetle feeding on an aphid. Um, makes sense, you know, if a prey was, um, the predator would be bigger than the prey. So uh, just kind of something as you're sort of looking and diagnosing, um, that's a good way to sort of determine. Uh, predators eat a lot during their lifetime, so they're a really good one to keep in your landscape um, because not only do they eat lots of prey, they also tend to feed on a broad range of species. Um, so, you know, they might, it's just kind of a buffet for them. They'll, they'll eat a lot of it and they'll eat lots of different things. Um, so some common predatory insects, we, uh, like I mentioned, the lady beetle, they prefer to feed on aphids or scale insects. Um, scale insects are a, um, they're an insect that almost, it, it looks like a scale actually on your plant um, and can feed, will feed on your plant um, and can be very destructive, but the, the lady beetles will eat the scale. If they run out of aphids or scale, they will eat other insects or other insects' eggs, but their preferred diet is aphids and scale. Um, they are coleoptera, uh, so they do have that complete metamorphosis. Um, but both of the immature and adult life stages uh, are predatory and they're both mobile. Um, the larva stage of a lady beetle actually looks quite different. That's that picture down in the right. Um, and that, so if you see that, it is actually a lady beetle larval and you don't want to try and control that. Um, so you might see that and think, wow, that's not a lady beetle, that's not a ladybug, but that is um, going to be a lady beetle. So don't, don't control those if you see them. And then I have this cartoon that I think is funny. <laughs> but they're very voracious feeders um, and they will go after, go after the aphids. 
Um, so some other common predatory insects, uh, ground beetles. So ground beetles are um, dark nocturnal beetles. Um, they generally hang out on the soil surface and look for insects in or on the soil surface. Um, uh, sometimes they will venture up into the plant to feed on caterpillars or other insects, but generally um, they kind of prefer to stay near the soil. Um, like I said, they are nocturnal, so during the day you probably won't see these guys quite as much. Um, but if you're able to provide a, a home for them during the day, then you're more likely to encourage these guys to come to your landscape. So the um, so doing things like having an organic mulch down, uh, maybe some wood chips or some straw, something that it can kind of burrow into and feel safe, um, or maybe just some nearby dense perennials or ornamental grasses um, that these ground beetles can get up in and harbor until the next night where they go hunting. Assassin bugs, I would think an assassin bug would be pretty good at killing other insects based on that name. Um, but they can vary in their prey of choice and uh, their choice of prey. Um, so they, they, they're not specific in their feeding, um, don't really have too, too specific of a diet, but you can really tell an assassin bug. Uh, they tend to be very long and slender. Um, they also tend to have a long and slender head and they've also got long front legs um, that are able really to use to grab insects uh, and feed on them and feed on them. Uh, but again, they are also very mobile uh, and will search out insects for food uh, if you've got them in your garden. So um, that top picture there is a wheel bug, kind of sort of interesting looking like it actually has maybe like a gear or something sticking out of its back. Um, and then just another assassin bug there on the bottom. So both of these are true bugs. Um, you can kind of tell by that triangle. Lacewings. Um, lacewings are a very ferocious feeder. Um, some, so much so that they sometimes are referred to as aphid lions because that's how much they um, will feed on, will feed on uh, aphids. Uh, they will also consume eggs of other species and then also whiteflies, uh, which can be a detrimental, a detrimental pest. When they reach the adult stage, they will only feed on nectar. Um, and you know, you might think, oh, well, it's not doing its job anymore if it's just feeding on the nectar, but you want those adults to have babies. And so if you provide a nectar plant or some pollinator plants nearby that are very high in nectar, uh, then those adults will continue to, um, to, to have babies and continue to have a, um, a population within your garden. Because what you want are the uh, larva. And that's what I've got in the bottom picture. They're very ferocious, aggressive feeders. Um, you can see those big mouth parts that will just latch on to an aphid um, and eat it. And kind of an interesting thing too about lacewings is that their eggs are laid on these silken stalks. I have a picture of it here. So if you ever see that, it kind of looks like something is wrong maybe with your plant, but those are actually lacewing eggs. And the reason that they have to um, lay their eggs in this fashion is because when the larva hatch out of those eggs, they will actually attack the other larva. So if they were all sort of in a cluster, they would hatch and then begin to all attack each other. Um, but when they are on these silken stalks, it actually makes it easier for them to get to each other um, and they don't attack each other and you have plenty of new lacewing larvae in your garden. Um, another one that we tend to think of pretty often is a praying mantis. Um, they are very generalist in how they feed, so they eat lots of different insects. Um, and so what they like to do is they kind of, um, there's some green species and there's some brown species, um, but they kind of blend in with the foliage and they will sit and wait there for unwary insects to wander too close. Uh, and then they have those highly specialized arms that they can use to just grab and feed those and eat those insects. Um, so while these are a predatory insect, they are such generalist feeders that they will also eat the beneficial insects um, as well as eating each other. So they're not the most effective insect control um, when it comes to predatory insects. Uh, but by all means, if you find one in the garden, don't mess with it. It's still going to eat um, some of those bad bugs for you. 
And then spiders, not everyone's favorite. Um, technically actually not an insect. Um, spiders are an arachnid, um, so kind of a different classification. They've got eight legs and uh, two body parts rather than six legs and three body parts. Um, but they're a great one to have in your, in your garden. Um, so if you can tolerate the sight of them, keep them there uh, because like they're very generalist predators um, and will be pretty much anything that is smaller than them or doesn't feel like that they, they're threatened by it. Um, and several different species of spiders have their own unique ways of, um, of eating insects. So, you know, a lot of times with spiders, we think of those webs and those webs that catch on um, sort of insects that are flying through and will catch those without them knowing and the spider will pounce on them that way. Um, but some spiders, like the wolf spider and the jumping spider, actively hunt. So they will stalk their prey and pounce on it um, the same way. And then some, like that top picture is a crab spider, some will wait in flowers. And so that spider will wait for, the, um, wait for any insects to visit that flower and then come out and pounce uh, and eat that, eat that insect. So again, another very good predatory insect to have. So moving on to parasitoids. Parasitoids are a um, very interesting and unique group of insects. So what they do is they actually deposit their eggs into a host and then those larvae will hatch, feed on the internal organs and tissues, and then bust out of that host. Um, so if you've ever seen that scene in Alien, that's basically what happens, except on a bug level. Um, I almost put a picture of that in here, but it was a little too gross. Um, but so in general, they are much smaller than their prey. Um, they, um, uh, it's easy for them to sort of kind of unknowingly sneak up on that insect. Um, they typically only consume one prey during their lifetime. So that's going to be the host that uh, they hatch on uh, will be their prey. Um, and they typically have a very narrow range of species. Uh, so one parasitoid will probably only attack one small portion of insects. So most of the parasitoids that we are familiar with in Oklahoma are either going to be wasps or flies. Um, generally, they are very, very small. Can't um, always necessarily see them with the naked eye or right off the bat. Um, like I said, they are host specific. So certain flies will only attack certain other insects. Um, and the good thing about this is that when they start to feed on those insects, um, before they die, they even start to have reduced feeding and activity, so they're less likely to be harmful to plants. So, you know, I mean, I, looking at that picture on the bottom right, that's a tomato hornworm um, covered in uh, the larva of a, uh, I believe it's a fly. Um, so by the time it gets to that stage, that caterpillar is not eating very much. Um, and you really don't actually want to remove that caterpillar because you want all those larvae to hatch uh, and create more adults to go on and um, lay more eggs so that you can continually have a group of parasitoids in your landscape. Uh, and then that there on the left um, is another way to kind of see if parasitoids have been in the garden. Those are aphid mummies. And so after the larva and the pupa have patched and become adults. It is the kind of empty carcass of an aphid, so sort of showing the uh, gray sort of brownish appearance is a good indicator that, yeah, that aphid's not doing much anymore. It is, it is dead. So some ways to promote um, beneficial insects within your garden. Um, so really reducing your insecticide use within your garden is very important. Um, like we were talking earlier with IPM, chemical control should really be the last resort uh, when managing insects in your garden. Um, but some other strategies, you know, I mean, sometimes we just have to. I mean, we garden to get um, the beauty of a landscape or we garden to get the food off of our vegetable plants. Um, and it, it's not very fun if we don't get to that point because insects have eaten us up. Um, so just some, some considerations that will really help with promoting beneficial insects are to use systemic insecticides um, on specifically non-blooming plants. So systemic insecticides are insecticides 
actually go up into the plant. And so that way when an insect feeds on it, um, it's actually ingesting that poison and dies. But the beneficial insects, which only really feed on the, um, the insects themselves and are not feeding on the plants, do not see the side effects of that systemic insecticide. Um, but I have it there, you know, only do this on non-blooming plants. That's important because if you do it on blooming plants, then when pollinators visit those blooms, they will be impacted as well. Um, so really only use systemic insecticides on non-blooming plants, but using systemic insecticides um, as opposed to contact insecticides can be a good way to keep those beneficial insects in the, in the area. Also use target specific insecticides over broad spectrum. Um, so insecticides are becoming a little bit more advanced um, and especially some of the organic uh, organic insecticides are very specific to which insects they are controlling, um, as opposed to something like carbaryl, which is seven dust. It's a broad spectrum product. So if you use that, it's going to kill anything it touches. Um, doesn't matter if it's a diptera or a lepidoptera, it's, if it touches it, it's going to die. So uh, try to use target specific insecticides before those broad spectrums. Um, and then also being aware when beneficial insects are not as active and spraying during those times, um, which typically tends to be early morning or late evening. Also giving those beneficial insects a place uh, of refuge. We kind of mentioned that earlier, um, but giving them a suitable microclimate somewhere they can go when they, um, somewhere they can kind of retreat to. So having uh, shrubs or perennials or tall ornamental grasses near places where we really want to have beneficial insects kind of gives them a spot to go back to during um, when, when they need a spot of, of refuge. Uh, and then also using organic mulches, so something for them to kind of climb under or ground cover plants uh, can really help with those ground dwelling predators, really sort of gives them a a spot to hide. And then also resource allocation. So if they need uh, pollen or nectar in order to reproduce, you know, supply that pollen and nectar for them to reproduce. Um, really providing them with those necessary tools uh, that they need to survive. Um, and then specifically too, when thinking about blooming periods, um, if you have perennials that um, bloom only in the early spring, when we get to the summer and the fall, the, those insects will not have that food source for, uh, for those time periods. So as you design your garden, make sure that you always have something in bloom um, so that there are plants that are rich in pollen and nectar so that those uh, predators, parasitoids, and pollinators have something um, to go on and um, something to help them survive. So Heather, do we have any questions in the chat so far? Take a little break. You, the only question was just to double check, do you provide the PowerPoint after your presentation? I am recording. I will provide, I can re provide the recording um, and I can provide a PDF of the PowerPoint. The, the okay. PowerPoint itself is too large to send out, but yes, we're recording and I can very easily send out the PowerPoint as a PDF. We just had one person ask if um, your information will be available later. We can make it available. Thank you. Oh, here's a question. Okay. Um, do you think people should purchase good insects? Oh, okay. Good question. I have that on a slide later, but we can go ahead and talk about it now. Um, so a lot of times you'll see um, at garden centers lacewing eggs or uh, lady beetle eggs and, and things that you can go ahead and release into your garden. So that can help, um, but a lot of times in a homeowner setting, just taking a cup of lady beetles and releasing it, they're going to go everywhere. Um, so it might not go after the uh, target that you necessarily intended. And so research has kind of shown that purchasing um, those good insects in placing them in your home garden might not be as effective as you really want them to be. Um, 
And so generally, uh, you know, those insects and, and that sort of methodology and that strategy is a lot better for places like greenhouses that are controlled so that the insects can't fly all over and go to your neighbor's garden or the garden down the street. Um, and so I'm not saying it's a bad thing. I'm not saying don't do it. Um, it just might not get you the best results that you want. Um, but really sort of providing the environment and the um, sort of microclimate to promote beneficial insects within your garden rather than going out and purchasing them and bringing them in, I think is maybe a better strategy. And Courtney, I saw on one of the garden pages I'm following that some people had bought some praying mantis eggs and that they were not a native praying mantis. And there were some people not native to the U.S. or something like that. Like it came from another country. And then they said that is not what you should be doing. Can you talk about that a little bit? Sure. So with any insect or anything, um, anything that's not native is not in our ecosystem and can really throw off the balance. So if we bring something that's not native in and it starts eating too much, that can really cause a problem. Um, so I'm trying to think, I know there's an example, but you know, there's, there, there's several invasive insects that we deal with and that we have within our, within our country that got here by those same sort of means like, oh, we have this invasive plant. Let's bring in this insect that's native to the same spot as this invasive plant. Oh, it ate all that invasive plant and now it's eating our native plants. Um, so really bringing anything that's not from the ecosystem, uh, it, it, it can backfire very quickly. So I, I generally would not recommend that. Okay, now we're gonna talk about uh, some ways that we can diagnose insect activity within our garden. So I, I kind of want you to familiarize yourself with signs versus symptoms. So signs are evidence of the actual insect. So that's proof that there, that is something the insect has, excuse me, something the insect has left, something the insect has done, um, that really gives you a good indicator that an insect has been there. Whereas symptoms are the plant's response to insect activity. Um, so, you know, it doesn't necessarily mean uh, wasn't exactly left there by the insect, but is the plant's response. Uh, so some examples um, are, uh, of signs are waste products. Um, so honeydew, which is a, um, a waste product of a lot of piercing sucking insects. Uh, and then frass, which is a funny word we use for insect poop. That's all that means is frass. Um, so webbing, um, insects make webbing, um, and then also cast skins or insects themselves. Um, so signs are indicators that the, um, the insect has been there, has done this, um, and is not necessarily associated with the plant itself. But symptoms, symptoms are associated with the plant themselves. So if you see discoloration or distortion of the leaves um, from overfeeding, that can be an indicator insects were there, but it's the plant's response to the insect's presence. So chewing damage, cracked bark, um, maybe if you see any holes on the bark um, or dieback of plant parts, those are all symptoms, um, the plant's response to the insect being there. Um, and so kind of knowing these can really sort of help you determine whether or not um, what kind of insect you have or or maybe what's going on because a disease can very easily cause discoloration or distortion of leaves. Uh, maybe you have a bacterial pathogen um, and that's the plant's response to that bacterial pathogen. So it doesn't make any good, it doesn't make any sense if you go and you purchase an insecticide um, which is supposed to kill the insects and spray it on something that is affected by a, a bacterial pathogen. So kind of sort of considering that um, can really help you diagnose what's going on with your plants. So insects have, we've touched on this, um, we've touched on this a little bit already, but insects have different types of mouth parts. Um, they're adapted to different things that those plants do. And so usually the feeding damage 
is determined by an insect's mouth parts. Um, so chewing, those two on the left, chewing and piercing sucking are the ones we are mostly gonna deal with when we're dealing with the bad insects in the garden. Um, so chewing, chewing is just like us, just chomping, chewing on the food. Piercing sucking is actually kind of like a needle that goes in and then sucks up either the juices or whatever it's feeding on. Um, and then those two on the right, typically not ones we're gonna associate with damage, but siphoning is um, a lot of times the Lepidoptera, so the butterflies or the moths. It's actually kind of like a, a siphon um, or a straw that can suck up that nectar. Um, and it's usually long and curled up so that it can get deep into those flowers. Uh, and then sponging is the gross one where an enzyme is released and then it is sucked back up as that enzyme breaks down. Um, but typically when we're talking about plants and plant damage, we really concern ourselves with the chewing and the piercing sucking. So this is some examples. These are some examples of a piercing sucking damage. Um, so kind of think about that needle-like mouth part going into the plant material and sucking back out the juices. Um, so we really get this stipled, almost gold dust, gold fleck um, approach or, or symptoms from the plant. So that is, um, that is kind of what we see there. And so who sucks, right? Um, so scale, scale, those are those insects I was talking about that have a very kind of like an armor um, and they will, will, they will latch onto your plants. Um, they've been really bad this year on oak trees. We've seen a lot of them come through the office. Uh, aphids also have piercing sucking mouth parts and will suck up those juices. Um, spider mites, spider mites are, um, again, they're not technically an insect, they're an arachnid, but boy, do we deal with them in the garden. So I'm, we're talking about them tonight, but um, spider mites have piercing sucking mouth parts and will suck up those juices. And then also the true bugs. So the hemeptrans that we talked about um, also uh, will have that kind of damage on, on your plants. So honeydew. Honeydew is something that is often very associated with the piercing sucking insects. So it's a sticky liquid excrement that builds up. So a lot of times they'll eat it, they'll get the nutrients out of it, and then they'll excrete the sugars. Uh, they don't want the sugars and so they will excrete that and that will stay on the plant. And so what we end up with is this kind of glossy, sticky substance on our plants when we have a lot of piercing sucking insects. Um, and what happens is the really sort of downside is this is it supports the growth of sooty mold. Um, so if you have a crepe myrtle and it's had crepe myrtle bark scale, you're probably very familiar with this. Um, but what happens is that sticky excrement begins to develop mold and it, it looks, it's very dark, it can drop on your concrete, on your mulch, um, and really just kind of looks like somebody took a blowtorch to, to your plant. Um, and what happens, that, what happens there is if that gets on quite a bit of your leaves, um, it can really sort of shade out and we lose that photosynthesis of, of those leaves. And so sooty mold is not a good thing. Um, and so honeydew leads to sooty mold. So just being aware of that uh, can kind of help us diagnose what's going on. So thrips, um, we talked a little bit about them earlier, but they have slightly different mouth parts than piercing sucking, um, but it makes their damage just a little bit uh, more interesting or, or a little bit more different and we can kind of diagnose it. Um, so they actually have kind of a rasping um, where it actually comes and scrapes off the top of the plant rather than um, actually piercing into it. Um, so instead of getting lots of little pinpricks, we kind of sort of get the scraping effect. Um, and since they're so small, it's a very small scraping, but um, you can kind of see there how in large numbers it would add up. Thrips really like flowers. Um, they, they tend to congregate within the flowers. And so if you ever see uh, sort of some white damage on flowers like that one there on the right, that can be a good indicator that those plants have thrips. Um, also, thrips really don't like oxygen. Um, so a kind of a trick that I was taught is if you blow on your plants, that will um, 
or not oxygen, I guess, um, just movement. They do not like movement. Um, if you blow on your plants, then they will start to come out. There'll be more movement and it's easier to see them on your plants. So if you ever suspect that there's strips damage, uh, maybe you're shopping at a nursery, just start blowing on all the plants um, to see if there are any thrips. So chewing damage as opposed to piercing sucking damage, this is the classic hungry, hungry caterpillar. Um, so actually going in and eating those leaves uh, and you end up with a very uh, holy um, skeletonized type leaf or or maybe overnight your just leaves are missing, but that's that's what chewing damage is. Um, and there's there's multiple different kinds of chewing damage. Um, so if you ever see um, maybe a leaf and it looks like it's been hollowed out and you can still see light through it, uh, that's a symptom we often refer to as window painting. Um, and then skeletonizing as well, which is where the leaves have been fed on in between all of the veins of the leaf. Um, so it really does look like a skeleton of a leaf. Chewing damage can be external and internal. Uh, so external is what we tend to think of when they're actually feeding on the foliage and we see them chewing, chewing on our leaves, but chewing damage can also be internal. So especially with things like wood borers that are within the trunks of our trees, they're burrowing in there, eating that internal wood, making those cavities, those tunnels. And you can think about as that water tries to move, or excuse me, as that tree tries to move water and nutrients um, within its trunk, if there's all these insect tunnels that the wood borers have created, it, it can become very difficult to effectively transport those nutrients and those waters in that water. Uh, so chewing damage doesn't just have to be outside, it can be internal as well. So who chews? Caterpillars, like we said, hungry, hungry caterpillars, they are ferocious feeders. Uh, beetles also have chewing mouth parts and um, will feed on our foliage. Uh, sawflies, which is the larval, the larval stage of a, of a fly species, and then also grasshoppers can be very ferocious and very quick to take over our garden or landscape. Um, so some other kinds of damage that you might find when looking at your plants, um, a leaf miner. Leaf miners are actually insects that go in and kind of sort of tunnel through, through the leaves. So sort of a unique, um, a unique symptom there. Root feeders as well. Um, so grubs are particularly bad about this, uh, but they feed on the roots and the shoots of various plants. And um, if those roots within your lawn or, or whatever you're trying to grow can't pull up nutrients and, and, and the water that it needs to because its roots are damaged, uh, that can very quickly lead to the decline of a plant. Insect galls are kind of a fun one. Um, a lot of times insect galls um, are not necessarily detrimental to, to a plant, um, but they are very unsightly. But what happens with the insect galls is an insect will come along and it will either feed or maybe lay an egg and then the plant itself will sort of have a response, uh, almost kind of like a tumor, if you will, to that feeding or that egg laying. Um, and so some galls um, will actually have the larval stage inside of those galls. Um, so if you see them, always crack them open and see what you can find. Uh, and then that bottom right corner, uh, the ova, ova position, uh, that is where if an insect were to go and lay an egg um, and actually pierce it with its um, ovipositor, which is what's used to um, to lay eggs, uh, then we can end up sometimes with a scar or some kind of damage um, that maybe we're not sure what that looks like or if that's feeding um, can be kind of unique. Uh, but it's there, it's on a very young uh, plum and that insect had laid an egg in there. And you can imagine that over time as that plum develops, that spot's gonna become very soft, become a good uh, entry for different various pathogens and various bacteria to enter into that fruit. Insects can also be vectors. Um, so these are the insects that do more damage by spreading disease rather than actually feeding on various plants. 
Um, so what they oftentimes do um, is they will feed on a plant that is infected with a certain disease, ingest that disease themselves, and then go feed on a healthy plant and slowly over time spread that, spread that disease. So an example, uh, some examples of some common ones that we see are pine wilt disease. Uh, so pine wilt disease is vectored by the pine sawyer beetle. Um, and as the pine sawyer beetle uh, lays eggs and begins to chew on that, on that pine tree, um, it actually has inside of it a nematode, which is a, um, <coughs> excuse me, a soil organism that um, clogs up the tissue within the tree. Um, so as it feeds from tree to tree, it puts that nematode inside to the tree and clogs up the tissue that's used to transport water. And so very quickly, um, we get a dead pine tree um, on our hands. So it can be um, kind of devastating if you have a pine tree uh, that is susceptible to that. Um, so make sure uh, if, if you've had issues with that one in the past, planting native pines or resistant, resistant evergreens is, is a good one. Um, rose rosette disease is another example of an insect vector disease that um, has become very common in our part, in our, in Cleveland County, in our part of Oklahoma. So it is a virus that is vectored by a mite. And so the mites are very, very small. You really can't see them. Um, and they suspect that one of the ways that this was really spread throughout neighborhoods was because people were taking their leaf blowers after they mowed and we're blowing leaves and leaf clippings, uh, but they're actually blowing those mites to the neighbor's house and to the next neighbor's house. Uh, and those mites just continually spread that virus throughout all these roses. Uh, so it's really hard to grow rose in Oklahoma right now. Uh, and then Dutch elm disease is another one that kind of um, was a really big one a couple, uh, several decades ago, but it took out a lot of elm trees. It was vectored by a beetle, um, a fungus vectored by a beetle into those elm trees and took out a lot of really pretty old elms um, kind of in the northeastern part of the country, but it's still sort of spreading um, throughout our area. So some control methods, we've kind of talked about really kind of how to diagnose and maybe some of the guys to look out for. Um, but so some control methods, so scouting is really key. Um, I always say it's way easier to control a small population than a large. So if you see insects that are, um, that are gonna cause you some problems, um, you know, go ahead and put in some control methods before it, gets to, uh, before it gets too late and you don't have any more plants. Any more plants. Um, so look for those signs and symptoms. If you see thrass, which kind of looks like, oh, uh, just maybe some black dust, um, that's that insect poop, if you see that, it's, it's a good indicator that there's been some insects there and maybe we need to start looking, looking for them. And really get into the garden, you know, start flipping leaves over, um, looking under things, you know, maybe looking underneath mulch to just see what you can find and see if you can find anything that, um, that might cause some problems later down the road. Um, and I know um, some of us are now working from home or have been working from home. So checking the garden regularly is really easy. Uh, nice to just kind of peek our head out there and see what's going on. Um, but checking the garden regularly can be a really good way to stay on top of those populations of insects. And then also consider thresholds. So consider, um, you know, consider your tolerance for things. Um, I kind of have it there in the bottom bullet point, but you know, how much are you willing to tolerate? Um, it's sort of a balance between maintenance and reward uh, of how much you want to do. Um, so, you know, if you have something that's feeding on um, just the leaves of the plant um, and maybe they're in small numbers, you know, it's probably not, you might not be worth it to control quite yet. You might keep an eye on it and sort of, um, wait and see what happens, but, you know, tolerating low numbers on the, uh, of those insects uh, can kind of be something to, to ask yourself. Uh, and then also focusing your controls and your efforts really onto the harvestable or the ornamental portion of the plant. Um, so that picture there, I apologize, it's a little blurry, but that's a tomato fruit worm. If you see, um, you know, a tomato 
and it's green and maybe it has some feeding in it and some holes in it, I get rid of it because it is going to um, only get worse and, and you really want to preserve those, uh, those portions of the plant that, that you enjoy. So, um, you know, really kind of focus your energy onto, onto that harvestable portion or that ornamental portion, uh, depending on your plant and what you're, you're really working with. So again, I'll say, you know, decide for yourself how much work are you willing to put into it? Um, because, you know, one spider mite on a leaf is not going to, is not going to kill your plants, but, you know, maybe two tomato hornworms can take out a group of tomatoes. So just kind of consider your thresholds. Cultural controls are uh, very important to consider before, um, th this is really good ways to prevent insects from getting into your, into your garden. Um, so variety selection is, is important. Uh, choosing plants that are well adapted to our area and, and that are known to do well in Oklahoma, um, particularly Cleveland County and the central part of the state uh, can be very, can get you a good head start because healthy plants are going to be more resistant to insects. Uh, insects tend to go after the unhealthy plants. Um, uh, it's kind of like if we, you know, if you get five hours of sleep and you don't eat very healthy, you're more likely to get to get a disease. The same goes for plants. If you're well adapted to where you are and you've got plenty of water and plenty of nutrients, um, you're you're more likely to, to withstand an insect infestation. Sanitation is also very important. I kind of have that demonstrated in the photo there on the right, but really making sure that you remove debris from the area that you're gardening. I know that's a field. Um, and if you have a garden that big, good for you, but I definitely don't. Um, but making sure to get out um, any of that plant material, that plant residue that you have left uh, at the end of the season. Um, because insects that like to eat, certain plants are going to hang out uh, in that residue and wait again for you for next year for when you plant the same thing. Um, so making sure to kind of clean that out and, and, and dispose of that properly can be a good thing. Uh, also timing your plantings, making sure uh, there, there's two sort of different strategies with this one. If you plant early and plants are able to really develop and become strong enough before the insect pressure really sets in, that, that can be sort of add a bolstered effect to your, to your plants or uh, still even waiting for later plantings, so like fall plantings. Um, you know, the insects, they found, they found your neighbor's garden. So they're eating on your neighbor's garden. And so if you plant later in the season, they're less likely to get those insect infestations because they haven't found them quite yet. Also doing things like putting out traps, and I don't necessarily mean like something that actually traps the insects, um, but doing something like placing boards next to your plants um, and then flipping that over in the morning and squashing the bad bugs that are underneath that board um, can be a very effective way. Also beer traps, um, particularly with slugs, are, um, are good. What you kind of do is fill maybe like a like a cat food can or a tuna can uh, with a little bit of beer um, and slugs will, will, will find that real quick uh, and die when they enter that trap. Um, some, some insects too uh, don't like, uh, you can do the same thing with maybe oil, like a vegetable oil, just kind of depends on the insect that you're, that you're fighting. Also barriers are a great uh, way to sort of prevent the insect from entering. So um, they sell insect mesh um, so something that you can kind of use to cover portions of your, of your garden if it's something you're concerned about. Um, also doing things like using coffee cans around your vegetables to sort of prevent any ground dwelling insects from kind of getting into, um, into the base of your plants. Uh, also a good strategy. And then, you know, never knock the idea of just mechanical removal. If you see a big juicy caterpillar on your plants and you don't want it there, just take it off. And, and dispose of it. Um, so, you know, that's always a good, that's always an option um, that I think gets overlooked. I know it's tedious, but it is, it is, um, it is, it is one of the easier ones. Um, so this is kind of what you're we talking about earlier, I think with that question of the biological controls. Um, so like I said earlier, you know, there are many beneficial insects that attack, 
attack insects. And you, a lot of times will see these for purchase, um, either online or um, maybe at a, at a garden center, but generally they have not been proven reliable for homeowners. We just don't have a controlled enough or a big enough of an environment um, for these insects to really stay uh, where we want them to stay. So kind of promoting an environment where they feel comfortable is a better strategy. Um, but there are some, uh, as a biological control, there are some fungal and bacterial pathogens uh, formulated as insecticides. So one of the most popular ones is Bt uh, or Bacillus thuringiensis. Don't ask me how to spell that off the top of my head. Um, but it is a popular fungal pathogen that is used as an insecticide to control caterpillars. Uh, so it is a naturally occurring, occurring, um, occurring pathogen and it can be used to spray, to spray those insects uh, and actually gets the insects sick and, uh, and, and kills, them, kills them that way. Uh, and so last, uh, the chemical controls, like I said, we usually try to use this as a last resort. Um, you know, do all those cultural controls, keep your plants healthy, try to keep the insects out, try to promote beneficial insects. Um, but, you know, sometimes it comes down to using chemical controls to, to control, those, control those insects. So if you do, um, always read your pesticide label. Um, this is crucial because these pesticides, while they, um, you know, while I know some people don't like to use pesticides, the labels are, is the law. And it is also the instruction on how to do it safely. Um, so if you follow that label, you can do, um, you, you'll be able to, to use that product safely and very consciously. So sometimes the pesticide will say, you know, don't spray when it's in bloom. Um, and that is to protect pollinators. Um, it will you generally have, yeah, Heather? Can you, pardon me. Sure repeat the names of the fungal and biological control names and uses? Yeah. So, the, the, um, so it's Bacillus thuringiensis, and I believe it is spelled B-A-C-I-L-L-U-S T-H-U-R I-N-G-I-E-N S-I-S. <laughs> and I can put that into the chat after the talk um, if that's easier for some of you guys. Um, so the bacillus, a lot of times it'll just be marketed as BT. Um, so BT caterpillar control um, it is oftentimes what you'll see um, kind of on the shelf at the box store. Uh, but you made me spell it. <laughs> Okay, um, so like I was saying with the label, um, you know, just make sure to read your label. Uh, sometimes too, you know, uh, pesticides will only be labeled to be able to use on ornamental crops. Um, if you use something that's only labeled to be used on ornamental crops and you spray that on your vegetables, you really can't eat your vegetables because you didn't follow the label um, and that's not what... Um, we don't want to know whether or not that's safe. So really pay very close attention to your labels. Um, and, and if you follow them, you can use them safely. Uh, but you know, there's a lot of difference too between those organic and that and synthetic. So organic insecticides, that just means it was derived from a naturally occurring, naturally occurring compound. So like BT, that's a pathogen that occurs naturally that we were able to formulate as an insecticide. Whereas a synthetic is going to be something that does not occur naturally and that was formulated um, and then tested through a lot of rigorous tests to make sure that it's safe. Contact versus systemic, we talked about that a little bit earlier as well. So contact is something that you actually have to spray it on the insect in order for the insect to die. Um, whereas a systemic is going to be something that goes into the plant itself and then as that insect feeds on the plant it ingests the insecticide and then gets sick. So kind of something to consider as you're looking as you're looking at your as you're looking at your pesticides. Um, also monitor your pest after you spray. Um, some, it's usually not a one and done. 
I wish it were, that would make it a lot easier, but um, it's a good idea to go back and check about three days afterwards to see um, if that spray was effective, if anybody survived that spray, and if there's anything else we need to do. Um, also on your pesticides, you will see modes of action. Modes of action are uh, in reference to the chemical family of that pesticide um, and how that pesticide actually physically makes that insect sick. Um, so with modes of action, um, you know, if you're spraying something over and over and over again and it's not working, you might look into seeing um, if there's a different mode of action um, and switching that up because it's, it, those insects may have become resistant to that specific mode of action. So if you see that on your pesticide label, that's what that is in reference to. Heather, do we have any other questions in the chat? We do, we have quite a few. So I'm quite a few, okay. I went back a little bit. So Andrea wants to know, do leaf hoppers do damage? She has those on her zucchini plants. Leaf hoppers? Leaf hoppers will do, um, they do have piercing sucking mouth parts. Um, and so if you're seeing them in high numbers and you're starting to see lots of symptoms, they might do damage. Um, a lot of times leaf hoppers too also act as a vector um, and can spread viruses. So there are some viruses that are um, impact, uh, that, that can infect zucchini. Uh, and so I would watch those very closely, uh, those leaf hoppers. Okay, I'm calling that PSD partly because I'm grossed out by the, what are you calling them? Suckers and whatever oh, you think sucking <laughs> yeah like ooh. every time you say that my arm hair raises so <laughs> um okay so Alyssa or Lisa wants to know we aren't supposed to spray until after dark right someone told me that way it protects pollinators is this true that is a good rule of thumb um a lot of times I believe we more often go with early in the morning or in the evening because that's going to kind of be the cusp between um, those daytime pollinators and those nighttime pollinators. Um, so typically early in the morning or late in the evening is really when activity slows down. Okay, and then Andrea's got one more. What about deterrents versus insecticides, question mark, and then neem oil, question mark? Mean oil. Okay. So um, deterrence, um, I know I'm trying to think of some examples. Like I've seen them before for maybe mosquitoes where we spray them and then it really just kind of deters them. It's really going to be more something like a scent that's very off putting to those insects. Um, and so they, they might be effective, but they're only probably going to be effective for a short period of time and they're probably not going to kill what you're looking for. Um, so that's kind of the difference between those two. Um, neem oil is a great organic pesticide that you can use, um, but I would offer you a little bit of caution. Um, the oils and the soaps, great pesticides. Um, we have to spray them usually a couple times to get really good control, but you know, that's okay. Um, but we can't spray them, the, and the label will tell you specifically, but we can't spray them when they're at high temperatures, uh, when we're at high temperatures. Um, so I want to say it's 80 degrees, um, which this time of year in Oklahoma is like at three in the morning, I think. So um, that's just kind of a, just kind of a cautionary note. You know, if you see maybe spider mites or something and you want to control them with those soaps or those oils, um, don't go do it at three o'clock in the afternoon because you will literally fry your plants if you do that. Okay, so this is really fascinating. Andrea is joining us from Los Angeles where it's all. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I am not as familiar with the, uh, I do apologize. I didn't know there were um, some non-Oklahomans in here. I, uh, so I, I believe you probably have lower temperatures than we do in, um, in the summertime a little bit more regulated um, but just pay attention to that label um, that label will tell you um, and specific to your state too um, so the labels that are on the pesticides that you choose to use 
uh, will be California approved in the stores and the garden centers where you're able to get them as opposed to maybe some of the ones that are Oklahoma approved um, because our different state governments uh, go through and choose whether or not those are safe to use in our area. Okay, then one last question so far. It's okay. is insecticidal soap good? Yes, yes. So I, um, you can purchase insecticidal soap at the box stores, uh, but like I said, it's usually probably going to have a temperature requirement. Um, so pay attention to that label. It's usually going to take multiple applications um, because really what it's doing is just suffocating the insects. Um, and so it may take a couple times to really sort of get them all the way you want to use them. Um, I know that there are uh, recipes on the internet for using Dawn dish soap or uh, anything like that and mixing it with water and spraying it on your plants. Um, and I know a lot of people have had very good experience with doing that. I don't usually recommend that so much because um, if you make something at home, it's not going to have a label that tells you how to use it. You don't know how much you should use or how much you shouldn't use or if maybe there's a possibility that if you spray it too much, you end up hurting your plants. There's no label to give you guidelines if you make your own pesticides. And so it's really not the best idea to do that. Also with um, making homemade recipes as well, um, a lot of the soaps that you purchase uh, to clean our dishes and things at home are sodium based. And so when they're sodium based, um, that actually will draw water out of your plants and, and dehydrate your plants. Um, so I don't really recommend doing, making your own insecticidal soaps um, because you can just go to a box store and purchase something that is formulated for use on plants that comes with a label with highly detailed instructions on how to use it. But that's, that's my kind of two cents on that. That's probably more than you wanted to know. <laughs> All right, are we good to move on? Fantastic, okay. So we are gonna finish tonight. Oh, wow, I have seven minutes. Okay, we'll go quick. <laughs> um, so we'll finish tonight out um, with just some kind of various insects that I um, that either we see a lot through the extension office or we um, uh, are just kind of interesting or weird or I just flat out don't like. So um, starting with ants. So ants are good or bad. Um, it kind of sometimes depends upon the species. Uh, but they're good for a lot of things. They disperse um, native seeds, so they will feed on seeds, um, they'll feed on the outer shell of the seeds and then disperse it. Um, and so it's a great way for plants to spread. Um, some of them are predatory and will, um, will feed on the, uh, the, the bad insects within our, um, is that a question? Or is that a... No. I was scratching my head. I'm, I thought you were trying to weigh me down. <laughs> I'm seriously like itching all over. I even put it in the chat. Is anybody else itchy? So, <laughs> sorry. You're going to be really itchy on the next slide. Now you're making me itchy. Okay. Um, but they can also be a nuisance in the home or garden. Um, it's not really fun to go sit out in the garden and work in the garden if there's a bunch of ants out there um, and kind of what they're doing. But sort of the fun, not really fun, well, maybe, depending on your perspective. But the interesting thing about um, ants and what they'll actually do is they actually farm aphids. And so what they will do is they will protect aphid colonies and um, make sure that those lady beetles and those lace wings and those predatory insects that we like don't eat the aphids. They will fight off those predatory insects so that they can eat the honeydew that is excremented by the aphids. So it's always kind of a double whammy if you find a bunch of aphids in your garden and then you also find out you have ants because then you have to work through the ants and the aphids to save your plants. Um, another one, another ant species that is particularly um, bad. Uh, I know the um, individual from Los Angeles, you probably don't, you don't have this in your area, I don't think, uh, but fire ants, they are a highly invasive ant. Um, they arrived in the 30s um, on a cargo ship in, Alabama, I believe. 
Uh, and what they do is they will displace native ant colonies. So they will take over um, an area and really be the predominant ant within that area. And what they do with where they kind of get their namesake is they bite and they sting at the same time. And so it does not feel very pleasant. What they also are very good at doing is they will kind of swarm you if they kind of get, if they get on your arm or maybe your leg, a bunch of them will climb up and they will release a pheromone and they will all bite and sting at once. And so that's really kind of where they get, uh, get their name from. Um, but they can be quite not fun to deal with. So um, they have sort of unique looking mounds, um, kind of like a honeycomb appearance. So they have lots of entrance holes into their mounds. Um, and so that's kind of the unique thing in the way you can tell them if you have fire ants versus any other species of ants is by those unique multi-entry spot mounds. Um, but here in Oklahoma, um, we have a quarantine in the southern part of the state. Uh, so that's really to try and prevent the spread of fire ants to other parts of the state. Uh, but unfortunately, we have found them in Cleveland County. Um, so while we're not quarantined, that doesn't mean they're not here. So just be aware, be careful if you see any of those fire ants. Earwigs. Earwigs are another uh, sort of unique looking insect. They're easily identified by those long pinchers on their abdomen. And no, they will not climb into your ears while you're sleeping at night and eat your brains, uh, even though that's what the folklore says about them. Um, they can be a nuisance in the garden. They chew irregular holes into flowers and leaves, um, kind of can notice it, but a lot of times it's not to a level that's so detrimental that we have to um, spray or do any kind of control measures. Um, it might just be a nuisance or unsightly, but a lot of times plants will grow out of it. Um, they love organic matter and moisture, so if you have down an organic mulch, um, or anything like that, um, they're typically attracted to that. Uh, sometimes if they get into your house, they are attracted to moisture, so you'll oftentimes find them in the bathroom or the kitchen uh, if you've got them. Uh, but they are also excellent decomposers, so they will feed on uh, material out in the garden and decompose that, um, so they're a great insect to have in your compost pile. Uh, so if you go into your compost pile, you start moving it around and you see lots of earwigs go everywhere, that's actually a good sign. Um, just don't keep it close uh, to your house like I did, or you'll get earwigs in your house. And your cat won't eat them for you. I speak from experience. Um, mole crickets are uh, kind of another weird sort of one. Um, but I kind of find these really interesting because they actually have these mole-like front arms that are used to dig. Um, but they're, they can be a destructive pest of lawns because um, they feed on the roots and shoots of our grass. Um, and they're very, very good diggers because they've got those front legs uh, to really dig and be able to make, um, to make tunnels within our, within our lawn. Um, if you do need to treat these, it's best to treat early in the spring. That's right when their eggs are hatching. Um, uh, they also create mounds. Um, that kind of look unique in their own way. So that's a good way to kind of um, be aware that you've got mole crickets. Twig girdlers are kind of a, an interesting one. Um, what they do is they will lay their eggs on the tip of a branch um, and then they will back up a little bit and actually chew around that branch or girdle that branch uh, to a very fine point. Um, and so that way when a big wind comes through the next couple days, then the those branches will actually fall to the ground with those eggs on them. So they're kind of just like, okay, go children, um, infest the earth. Uh, and those twigs will, will fall onto the ground. But the um, kind of the way you can tell that you've got twig girdlers is if you have a lot of branches on the ground after a windstorm and you have and they've got very um, perfectly sawed off edges. Um, if they're cracked or anything that probably happened naturally but if you see that they've got um, that very uh, straight edge on them then you've probably got twig girdlers in your area. Um, 
but you know the easiest way to just to, to get rid of them is to uh, rake up those fallen branches and and destroy them either throw them away or um or, or burn them burn them in your fire pit and that can be good ways to to get rid of it bagworms i hate bagworms they <laughs> are um they're kind they're quite a nuisance uh, but what they do is the larva will actually um, feed on the feed on plant material. So they'll feed on, uh, they're, they're pretty fond of evergreen species. And as they're feeding, those caterpillars will actually take needles um, or plant material and stick them to themselves and slowly build cocoons um, as they reach the pupa stage. So when you see them on your tree like that, that's actually the pupa stage. They have finished feeding um, and they've attached themselves to the tree. Um, and what will happen is the males will hatch from their pupa and they will go and find the female pupa. And then they will actually make eggs in that bag. And then the eggs will fall, um, or excuse me, the eggs will hatch the following year. So the females never leave uh, their cocoons, which I think is kind of sad, um, but that is that is kind of how their life cycle is. So if you see these on your trees, you really do want to remove them um, because some of them might have eggs in them that are waiting for the following year to hatch. Um, but if you have a small tree, it's very easy to hand pick them off. Um, if you have a large tree, it can be a little bit difficult to control, but um, again, consider your threshold levels and how much you're willing to tolerate. Great myrtle bark scale. I apologize, I don't think this one's in California yet either, um, but this is one that we've got quite a bit in our area. It looks like it has uh, soft white, they're, they're scales, but they're soft and they're white and they look like they're fuzzy, um, but they feed on the crepe myrtles um, and can cause a lot of problems. So it's a very slow decline. You'll start to see less flowering um, and then a lot of that sooty mold like we talked about. Um, so a lot of that almost looks like someone took a blowtorch to it. I don't recommend, um, it's best to control in winter using dormant oils, some of those dormant horticultural oils. Um, and like we said earlier, if you apply those in the summertime, um, you're going to probably end up frying your plants uh, and cause more damage than those crepe myrtle bark scales would have caused in the first place. Also don't recommend using systemic insecticides because systemic insecticides, um, Crepe myrtles have a very long bloom period. And so if you use a systemic insecticide, lots and lots of pollinators are gonna go visit those blooms. And if you've used a systemic insecticide, it's gonna poison those pollinators. So I don't recommend doing that. Cutworms um, attack a large range of plants, but what happens is the adults will lay their eggs fairly close to a plant on the surface area, uh, of the surface level of the soil. And when they hatch, those caterpillars will climb up the plant and chew it off. So if you ever go out to your garden and it looks like all of your transplants have just been chopped in half, um, it's likely that you've got cutworms. I'm gonna go fast because I know we're over. Um, tomato hornworms, another gross uh, sort of wild looking one uh, that we encounter. It's very important to scout these early on uh, because three larvae can defoliate a plant overnight and really um, really take down really take down your tomato plants. I will say um, just a cautionary note the adult form of a tomato hornworm is a sphinx moth which is a very valuable pollinator. Um, so maybe if you don't want to kill it because you know it's a good pollinator maybe pick it up and throw it into your neighbor's garden next door. Um, that can always be an excellent control method as well. Let it eat their tomatoes not yours. Um, but this is when we see a lot of times with the parasitoids and the parasitic wasps. Squash bugs, they are an infamous insect of vegetable gardens, gardeners. Um, they can take out squash plants very quickly, but they have the piercing sucking mouth parts. And so you start to see that stipling, uh, those little yellow flecks, um, and can find it, uh, can find it on squash bugs. Um, it's important to familiarize yourself with all stages of the squash bug. That way you know what you're looking for when you go out to scout. Um, so the eggs kind of look like little footballs. Um, the nymphs tend to congregate. They, um, they're very friendly with each other, so you'll usually find them in large numbers. Um, but 
kind of familiarizing yourself with what they look like so that you can scout. It's very hard to control squash bugs because there are very few recommended pesticides. Squash rely on pollinators to create squash. And so if you spray pesticides on your squash bugs, um, and it's a broad spectrum, you're also gonna be ending up spraying those pollinators and you don't end up with squash either way. Um, so it's really best to scout and look for squash, squash bugs early on and catch them before they take over your plants. Peach tree borers. Um, peach tree borers are a wasp, um, but kind of the gross and interesting thing about this one is that they actually bore into your peach trees, but if you ever see this oozing gummy appearance at the bottom of your peach tree, that is actually the wound from a peach tree borer emerging from your peach tree. Um, so if you see that, it's a good indicator that you've got peach tree borers in the area and um, you have about eight to 10 days to treat your peach tree uh, before the adults will come back and lay eggs on that same tree. Um, so it's a good, uh, good idea if you're growing peaches or any sort of fruit like that to look for any of that gummy nastiness around the base of the tree. And then I think this is my last one, but green June beetles, they are uh, very large, I mean, large, uh, beetles with a green brownish appearance. Um, the larval stage is a nuisance in lawns. It can be a grub. Uh, it's one of the many grub species that we have in our lawns, but it is, they love fruit, uh, the adults do. So if you're trying to grow peaches or apples or even cantaloupe, one time I was um, working uh, for a vegetable grower and we were in the cantaloupe part of his field and there was a cantaloupe in the field that was completely covered with these insects, it was so gross. But um, they love they love fruit, so um, I just kind of watch for them and be aware for them. But the, the kind of the problem with them too is that um, you're very limited in the pesticides that you can use because you're spraying it on fruit, um, and so it has to have a very short residual so that that chemical has um, sort of gone through its lifespan by the time we go to eat it. So in conclusion. Um, like I was saying, insects are a very diverse group uh, of animals, the, the biggest, um, the most diverse group of living organisms on the planet. Um, and so there are lots of different kinds of insects. Um, and so while we tend to think it's kind of human nature to, to be grossed out by bugs, there are a lot of good insects in the garden. Um, and we should really create an environment that encourages those good bugs so that they can do what they're intended to do and eat those bad bugs. Um, but also be strategic and aware of what those bad bugs do and what their damage looks like uh, so we can make calculated decisions when it comes to management. Um, so just some resources real quick. Um, if you are interested um, in any of our fact sheets, we have a recently updated fact sheet database uh, it's there at that URL and you can go to search, type in anything uh, that comes to mind and it will pull up all of our information on that specific topic. Um, so it used to just search for fact sheets, but now it searches for press releases and blog articles. And so it's very comprehensive if you want to go, uh, go to that spot. Um, and just some fact sheets I kind of want to highlight um, if you want to dive into some more information. There's the home vegetable garden insect pest control um, that really goes through a lot of the common insects and the vegetables. Um, conserving beneficial arthropods in residential landscapes. So that's a good one. Um, really, if you're looking to protect those parasitoids and predators. Uh, and then also safe use of pesticides in the home garden is a good one to check out as well. Um, also follow us on social media. Uh, we have a Facebook and an Instagram. We post uh, garden tips. Uh, we also post if we start to see something coming through the office um, and we want to make you all aware of it. So we were seeing a lot of spider mites in June. Uh, and then we'll also post about the events that we've been having. Um, been doing a lot of webinars the past couple months um, and we'll probably keep that up for the foreseeable future. But if you want uh, quick updates on the events we're having, check out our Facebook page. So thank you and what questions do you have for me? Okay, so I did share on the chat your website and then where your calendar of events is also. Oh, awesome. 
bright stuff. The Trumba calendar, is that what? The shared calendar.okstate.edu dot slash OCS. Yes. Yeah. And then the extension dot ok dot edu and then specifically Cleveland County. Fantastic. Okay, so let me, I'm just going to start from the bottom. So Andrea said in California, they call them fig beetles because they love figs. Yes. Those are Japanese beetle, is that right? Okay, Japanese beetle and the green June beetle are different. So the, um, and yes, we in um, our master gardeners have a demo garden and there's a fig tree in the demo garden and I, I will support them being called fig beetles. <laughs> um, but so Japanese beetles are different. They're actually an invasive. Um, they were introduced from Japan. So whereas our green June beetles are native, uh, the Japanese beetles are not. Japanese beetles are a bit smaller than the green June beetle. They're kind of brassier, kind of have a bit more shiny appearance. Um, but the way you can really tell the difference between them is the small white tufts on their abdomen. Um, so if you see those small white tufts, it's a good indicator that we, um, that, uh, that that's a Japanese beetle rather than a green June, June beetle. So the Japanese beetles are much more um, in the western part of the country, and we do have them in the western part of the state, but we haven't really seen them quite yet in um, Cleveland County. So Nan has a question, is plum curculio spread by an insect? Plum curculio is an insect. So it is a weevil um, that will lay its eggs. Actually, um, that slide I had where it was the damage to the plum, that was plum curculio damage. And what they'll do is they'll lay their eggs on the plum. I mean, when it hatches into the larva, it will chew and eat that plum uh, and then emerge as an adult. Okay, and so Nan shared a tip. She said that she found a trap for peach borers from something called Gardens Alive. Awesome, yeah, that is a good way to see. So if you're not able to keep on top of looking, like if you have a large acreage of peaches and you can't check every individual peach tree for that gumminess around the base, trapping is going to be a really excellent way to monitor what's going on in the field. Okay, I think I've got everybody's comments. I mean, we had a lot more chattering going on, but I do have all the questions, I believe. So. Fantastic. Well, I'll hang on for just a little bit if anybody else has anything, but I appreciate you all for joining me tonight. Um, we're having another one. I want to say I can look up the date real fast, but it's called Talking Trash, and it's going to be on compost. Um, I'm pulling up my calendar to confirm the date. It will be July 22nd if you want to join. Same time, same place um, on your computer uh, on July 22nd at 630. You've got great job. Very informative. <laughs> Thank you. And then um, Andrea also said she attends a lot of Zoom or uh, webinars for work, and this has been very entertaining. <laughs> Good. Good. I, uh, I'm not terribly used. This is only, I, I think maybe my fifth. I'm getting very seasoned. But it's, it's definitely an adjustment to going from teaching in a classroom to teaching in a webinar. So I appreciate the, I appreciate the feedback. Oh, and I figured out how Andrea found out about it. I shared it in my garden groups on my Facebook page. Oh, awesome. Okay. I was wondering, because I know last, maybe it was the soils one, we had someone from Delaware. And so. Well, I've been cool. I didn't even think of that to ask. So until tonight, I thought, well, how did she know about this one? And I'm on a lot of gardening groups and I share them, hoping, you know, somebody will find something that they need. So. Yeah. Thank you. I appreciate you monitoring for me. It helps out a lot. <laughs> I'm increasing my skills. I can put them on my resume. Good. <laughs> it's <a> mutually beneficial. <laughs> I don't know. I'm a good bug. What are you? <laughs> I'm a bad bug, that's for sure. Oh, no. <laughs> I'm going to mute myself now. Yeah. <laughs> 
All right, I'm going to go ahead and quit recording. Awesome. All right. Okay, good evening, guys. I'm going to I'm going to log off. If you have any questions, feel free to email me. Bye. Bye.